You are listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby of Torch in Houston, Texas. This is the Living Jewishly Podcast. All right, welcome back everybody to Everyday Judaism. This week we're going to talk about the halacha of the Jewish laws regarding Rosh Hashanah, the Day of Judgment, and this is from the Kitzah Shulchan Aruch, the abridged Shulchan Aruch. And it is Simon 129, chapter 129. Number one, during the days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we add the words Le'ela u Le'ela, exceedingly beyond, to the Kaddish. We say that God is beyond, God is exceedingly beyond. Number two, since there must be 28 words in this section of Kaddish, we combine the words Min Kol and it becomes Mikol Berchaso. We combine that word because we're adding an extra word of le'ela u le'ela. So now we have to take away one word and we combine instead of having two words, min kol, it becomes mikol. Some have a custom to pray all the Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur prayers while bowing with their heads bent down. However, since we need to bow for the blessings of the Amida, it is proper to stand upright prior to reciting those blessings that need bowing. Also, Since it is forbidden to bow at the beginning or end of any other blessings, it is therefore proper to stand upright during those parts. It is not proper to pray the silent Amida out loud. Many times people are saying, oh, it's Rosh Hashanah, it's Yom Kippur, I'm going to pray as much as I can out loud so it awakens my focus, but it's not appropriate for us to recite it out loud for other people to hear. One should use tremendous caution to pronounce each word properly inside a sitter or machzer. From Rosh Hashanah through Yom Kippur, we make the following substitutions in our Amida. Instead of saying Hakel HaKadosh at the end of the third blessing, it becomes HaMelech HaKadosh, the King, the Holy King. And instead of saying HaMelech Ohev Tzedaka Umishpat, it becomes HaMelech HaMishpat. If one forgets the substitution of Amelech HaKadosh, the Amida must be repeated. If one is unsure, it is assumed the proper words were recited. This also applies to the Chazan reciting the repetition. During the Friday evening prayer of Magin Ovos, we also substitute Hakel HaKadosh with Hamelech HaKadosh. Additionally, we add the following passages into our Amida during the days from Rosh Hashanah through Yom Kippur. We add Zochreinu Lachaim is added in the first blessing. Mi Chamocha Avarachamim Zochre Yitzur of Lachaim Berachamim is added in the second blessing. Uchsov Lachaim Tovim Kolbnei Brisecha is added in the Modim prayer, Modim blessing. And Besefer Chaim Tovim is added in the final blessing. We also modify the Oseh Shalom to say Oseh HaShalom during the 10 days from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur. If Rosh Hashanah falls on Shabbos, like it does this year, we recite a shorter Kabbalah Shabbos service. Most congregations begin from Mizmor Ladavid, which is right before Lachadodi, and have an abridged Lachadodi as well. After Marev on the first night of Rosh Hashanah, we greet one another with Lashana Tova, Take a Sevu, Semu. You should be inscribed and sealed for a good year. During the day, this is not said, since the judgment is already written before midday. Some greet this way also on the second night, as sometimes one is judged on the second day of Rosh Hashanah. At the meal, we add signs and symbolic gestures for a sweet new year. We dip the challah in honey. We dip a sweet ha- a sweet apple in honey and recite, may it be your will that you renew for us a good and sweet year. We eat a piece of the head of an animal, a sheep or a fish, and recite that we should be as the head and not as the tail. We eat carrots, marin in Yiddish, and recite that marin means to increase, that our merits increase. We eat fish and recite that we should be fruitful and multiply like fish. There are many other symbolic foods that are eaten, and each family should follow their custom. We do not eat nuts during the 10 days between Rosh Hashanah until after Yom Kippur. As nuts, egos is the same numerical value as sin, chet. You know, they, they came to one of the Hasidic masters and they said to him about, oh, we shouldn't eat nuts because nuts is symbolic of sin. 
you know, because they have numerical value. He says, you know, sin is also the same numerical value as sin. So just stay away from sin too, okay? Not only from nuts. One should say words of Torah at the Shabbos and Yom Tov table. Many learn the Mishnah of Rosh Hashanah at the Rosh Hashanah table. It is proper not to engage in marital relations on both nights of Rosh Hashanah unless it is mikvah night, in which case the man should dip in the mikvah the following morning as well. Since it is Yom Tov, holiday, when reciting Avinu Malkeinu on Rosh Hashanah, we do not pound our chest like on the rest of the 10 days of repentance. A person should be very careful and diligent with the words, having an understanding of the words of Avinu Malkeinu, our father, our king, we have sinned before you. Our fathers sinned before you and served idolatry, but we have no king other than you. Therefore, our father, our king, do for us for the sake of your name. When we take out the Torah, it is customary that we recite the 13 attributes of mercy. And it is proper to begin from Vayavor Hashem Aponav, Vayikra, and Hashem passed their judgment before him, and he pronounced Hashem, Hashem, Kel Rachel, etc., etc., et the 13 attributes of mercy. On Shabbos, however, most customs do not recite the 13 attributes of, of mercy nor the special prayer that goes after the 13 attributes of mercy. Okay, so we know that we blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah. What's the pr- we do not blow the shofar on Shabbos because it is Mokta. We blow sh- shofar this year. It'll be only on Sunday that we blow the shofar. Uh, so the proper order of the blows of the shofar should be as follows. The Teruwa should have nine very short sounds. The Shavarim should have three short sounds, one after the other. So the nine of the Teruah should be the same time span as the three of the Shavarim. And it, a person should be very careful that the nine short sounds of the Teruah shouldn't be extended very, very long. Because then the people hearing the shofar will not fulfill their obligation. So the proper order of how they're done is tekiah, which is one sound, shivarim, which is three short sounds, and then teruah, which is nine shorter sounds, and then tekiah again. And that's one set of the tekiahs. So well, there are different sets. So we do the tekiah, shivarim, teruah, tekiah, the one, three, nine, one set. But then we have a set of one tekiah, three shivarim, and one tekiah. And then we have another set, which is one tekiah, one teruah, which is the nine sounds, and then again, a one tekiah. When do we blow the shofar? We blow the shofar before the musaf service. And the way you blow the shofar of the, sh- the sounds of the three and the nine, when you blow the shofar before musaf, should be with one breath, meaning you don't take a breath between the three and the nine person who reads out the sounds that are about to be blown by the shofar blower should read them appropriately as well, not shavarim teruah, but rather shavarim teruah, to make a, a note for the one blowing that it's one one breath. However, the blowing that's done during the repetition of the Amidah, that should be done with two separate breaths, one for the shavarim, one for the teruah, one for the three and one for the nine. Regardless, there shouldn't be a break between the two parts. You can take a breath, but not more than that. Okay, when the uh, Baltokea, the one who blows the shofar, recites the blessing, the congregation should not respond, Baruch Hu, Baruch Shemo. So when the blessing, when the blessing for the shofar is recited aloud and they're, they're having everyone in mind, they should not respond, Baruch Hu, Baruch Shemo, blessed are you, blessed is your name, after saying the name of Hashem, because when you're hearing someone include you in a blessing, you should not respond. That will be a, a separation of the blessing. It'll be an interruption to the blessing. Everyone should listen carefully, and after each of the blessings, the entire congregation should answer Amen. Once the blessing is recited, till the, bl- the shofar is blown, 
it should there should not be any type of separation. A person shouldn't either talk. And it's proper for the Gabai or the Shamash of the synagogue to announce that people should not talk till the end of the 100 sounds are blown. It is a general custom to recite between the sets of the shofar blasts the prayer of may it be your will as printed in the Machzor. Okay, however, those who recite those prayers must take care not to actually verbalize the names of the angels mentioned there. In many congregations, they do not say the prayer of Yehiratzon, may it be your will at all. This practice is more proper. It's best not to say anything that's not part of the actual prayer during, you know, between the sounds of the shofar. The most important part of the shofar blowing is to arouse oneself to repent with complete sincerity. As the Rambam of Blessed Memory writes, and the following is the words of the Rambam, although the sounding of the shofar on Rosh Hashanah is a scriptural decree, no reason is provided for this mitzvah. It does contain an illusion as if to say, arise sleepers from your sleep. Slumbers, wake up from your slumber. Scrutinize your deeds and repent and remember your creator. Those who forget the truth due to the involvement with passing futilities and are preoccupied all their years with vanity and emptiness, which is not useful, nor does it save them, search your souls and improve your ways and actions. Each of you should abandon your wicked ways and improper thoughts. Until this point are the words of Rambam. This is what Rambam says. During the repetition of the Amidah, when the Chazan says, Va'anachnu korim, but we kneel, the nations of the world, they bow down to idols, but we kneel to Hashem. By the way, the nations got it from us. That's what we did in the Holy Temple. When the Chazan says that, the custom is for the congregation to recite it with him. And they kneel and bow, but they do not fall on their faces, meaning they don't bring their faces to the floor. You have something, a barrier between your head and the floor. Rak Bioma Kippurim. This, the falling on the face, is done only on Yom Kippur, during the recitation of the order of the Avoda of the temple service. The Chazan should also kneel, but he may not move from his place during the Shemon Esri prayer. We have our feet in one place during the Amidah, and because you bow down shouldn't mean that you just move your feet away. Your feet should stay in the same place. Therefore, the custom is that he stands a short distance from the lectern at which he prays so that he will be able to kneel without moving from his place. What we do is today because we have a lectern which is not a stationary lectern in most synagogues. Many synagogues do have a stationary one, in which case the chazan needs to prepare and move a few feet back or foot back or two feet back so that he can still have a place to kneel and without moving from his place. After he kneels, those standing near him should help him rise so that he will not need to move his feet from their position. Regarding the tekios, the blowing of the shofar, that are sounded during the repetition of the prayer, the chazan who is reciting the repetition of prayer should not sound the shofar unless he is confident that he will not thereby become confused with his recitation of the prayer. So there are many of the great Hasidic leaders, the Hasidic masters, the Rebbe, the, the, the headmaster of the entire congregation, the leader would lead the prayers and also blow the shofar. So if you're the one blowing the shofar and you're the one leading the service, it could become confusing uh, you know, you're reciting this, and now you're blowing the shofar, and now you're reciting that. You can lose your place. There's, there's a lot of things going on. It's best that one should not do both of them. Number 17. Regarding the tkios, the blowing of the shofar during the chazan's repetition of the Shmon Esrei, there are various customs as to how many are sounded. And each place should follow their custom. Likewise, with regard to the tkios after the prayer, there are various customs as well. After the completion of all of the tekios, after all of the shofar blowing, according to the custom of that place, the shofar should be put away and they should not sound any more. That means there's a hundred sounds that we should blow and not more. Even one who wishes to be the person who blows the shofar on the second day of Rosh Hashanah should not sound the shofar on the first day to practice. You want to practice? You have... 
30 days before Rosh Hashanah to practice. But on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, you don't practice. For the second day, especially this year, because this year we have we have Shabbos. If there is a circumcision that falls out on Rosh Hashanah, the circumcision is performed following the Haftorah reading and prior to the sounds of the shofar. An allusion to this order can be found in the words Zechor Bris Avram, which is the Bris, that was the covenant of Abraham. Ve'akeda Sitzchak, what's the binding of Isaac that's alluding to the shofar? So you, you do the covenant of Abraham before you do the covenant of Yitzchak. On Shabbos, when the shofar is not sounded, the circumcision is performed after Ashrei is recited before Musaf. If it is necessary to perform the circumcision at the home of the infant's mother, then the circumcision is performed after the prayers when the congregation leaves the synagogue. Halacha number 19. If one has already fulfilled his obligation of hearing the sounds of the shofar and he needs to sound the shofar for others, he may also recite the blessings before the sounding of the shofar again. Nevertheless, it is better that the one who needs to fulfill the mitzvah now should recite the blessings for themselves. One who sounds the shofar for women, if he has already fulfilled the mitzvah, he should not recite the blessings for them. Rather, the women should recite the blessings. This is because insofar as the halachic requirement, women are not obligated in the mitzvah of hearing the shofar. Since it is the positive commandment contingent upon time, and we know that anything which is a time-bound mitzvah is not an obligation for women. Some say that one who has already fulfilled the obligation should not sound the shofar for women at all, and therefore one who wishes to sound the shofar for women should do so before hearing the shofar in the synagogue. And when uh, sounding the shofar for the women, he should recite the blessing for the sounding of the shofar and have in mind to fulfill his obligation that he will fulfill later on. This may be done as long as it is not within the first three hours of the day because during the time that time, the individual should not sound the shofar. Alternatively, why should he not? Probably because that's the time of judgment. It says the first three hours of the day are time of divine judgment. Sounding the shofar as an individual during this time can have the effect of inviting the special judgment upon the individual without the benefit of communal merit. Alternatively, he may sound the shofar for them at the time that it is being sounded in the synagogue or after the shofar sounding in the synagogue before Musaf. But he should have in mind not to fulfill his own obligation with the shofar sounds in the synagogue, but rather with the shofar sounds that he is sounding for the women. And then he may recite the blessing for them. And even though he goes afterwards to synagogue to pray the Musaf prayer and to hear the sounds of the shofar during the Musaf prayer, this interruption does not require him to recite the blessings again because all the shofar sounds are considered one mitzvah. If a woman is weak and she needs to eat before hearing the shofar blasts, she may eat. Leaving the synagogue after prayers, one should walk in a calm and relaxed manner, happy and in good spirits, trusting that Hashem has listened to the sound of the prayers and the shofar with mercy. We eat and drink during the meal, commensurate to the blessings of Hashem. Nevertheless, one should take care not to eat to the point of gluttony, and the fear of Hashem should be evident upon his countenance. It is proper to study Torah at the table. After reciting the grace after meals, the Bir Kasamazon, one should not nap, rather, one should go to the synagogue and recite Tehillim with the congregation until the Mincha prayers. However, one whose head feels heavy and he would be unable to properly function without it may sleep a bit before going to the synagogue. Now, why don't we sleep on Rosh Hashanah? Why do we make all of these signs and symbols during our meals? Because our sages tell us that Rosh Hashanah is a microcosm of the year. And everything we do during Rosh Hashanah will have an influence on our coming year. So if we eat sweet things, if we act in a kind way, then that will influence our coming year. If we are angry, God forbid, it can have a terrible impact on our year that, God forbid, our year could be filled with anger and disappointment. After Mincha prayers, the congregation goes to the river for the Tashlich service. Lizkor zchus ha'akeda. The reason for this 
is to recall the merit of the Akedah, the binding of Isaac. As the Midrash states, when Avram, Avinu, and Abraham, our patriarch, was traveling with his son Isaac to the Akedah, to the binding of Isaac, the Satan, the evil inclination, transformed himself into a river to prevent Abraham from continuing his journey. Abraham, may peace be upon him, then proceeded to cross the river until the water reached his neck. The Amar, and he said, Save me, O God, for the water has reached the soul. There is another reason for this custom, for on this day of Rosh Hashanah we coronate the Holy One, blessed is He, as King over us. The practice is to anoint the King by the river, to indicate that their reign should be extended just as the river extends. It is better that the river be out of the city and contain fish. This is to remind us that we are compared to to these live fish that are caught in traps, so too we are caught in traps of death and judgment. And by virtue of this imagery, we will think further thoughts of repentance. Another reason for the preference that there be fish is to serve as a symbol that we should be impervious to the evil eye. Just like fish, that they're below the surface and not seen so well by the evil eye or by our eye, so too we should be hidden from the evil eye, and that we should be fruitful and multiply like fish. Some say that the reason is because fish have no eyelids, and their eyes are constantly open. By this, we arouse the eye of the one above to be open and to look after us. If there's no river there with fish, they may go to another river or to a well. Okay, so if you go today, even the bayou has fish in it. So if you can find the bayou that has fish, that's great. But it should be a place with moving water, and it should be a place that has fish. Now, if someone does not have the ability to find a place on Yom Tov that's walking distance, then you can do it up till the end of Sukkot, till Shemini Atzeres. Till then, you can do you can perform this great mitzvah of Tashlech. And what we do by Tashlech, we'll see here in a minute, is we recite certain prayers and then we shake off our clothes, which is symbolic of us shaking off our sins into the water. Standing by the water, we recite the verses of Mikel Kamocha, who, O oh God, is like you, as is found in the Tashlech service printed in the Sudurim and Machzorim. We shake out the hems of our clothes as a mere illusion to take to heart to cast away one's sins through repentance and to search and examine one's ways from today onward, so that one's clothes should be white, his actions should be free of sin. If the first day of Rosh Hashanah falls on Shabbos, then we go to the river on the second day of Rosh Hashanah, which is Sunday. After the congregation has returned to the synagogue for Tashlich, and the time for Mariv has not yet arrived, one should take care to avoid socializing with groups of friends so that he will not become, God forbid, to speak with others idle chatter, idle matters. Rather, he should engage in Torah study or recite psalms to Hillim or study Musa works, works on ethics that inspire a person to improve, him, to improve himself because this day is holy to our Master Hashem. The two days of Rosh Hashanah are regarded as one extended day. It's Yoma Arichta. And, by the way, there's a huge mistake, sadly, that some Jews think that it's a two-day holiday because we're in the diaspora. It's not true. In Israel, it's also two days, and it's regarded as one extended day, just like it was when God created Adam and Eve on day six of creation. The sun didn't set till Saturday night. It was one long day. And these are the two days that we celebrate of Rosh Hashanah is these two days, the, the Friday and the Shabbos of creation. And they are one extended period of holiness. Therefore, with regard to the blessings of Shehech Yonu, that we recite that God has kept us alive and brought us to this point, there's authorities that disagree of whether or not on the second night we recite the blessing. And likewise, whether one should recite upon the lighting of the candles, the Yom Tov candles, on the second night. And likewise, whether one should recite Shehechianu by the blowing of the shofar on the second day, 
because some say because it's one long day, oh, the the laws apply on, as one day. You read it already. The first day you said the Shehachianu, and therefore it should apply for the second day because it's really one long day. So therefore, in deference to this, oh, so so some opinions say you should not recite it the second day, but in deference to this opinion, the custom is that at Kiddush on the second night, Menichin ala Shulchan pri Chadash, we place a new fruit on the table, a fruit that you didn't eat yet this year, and therefore you'll recite the Shehachianu on that new fruit. Or alternatively, one could wear new new clothes or have something new for that they wear for the second night, and that way, when they recite the kiddush the second night, it will apply for the new garment that they're wearing. If a person does not have new fruit or new garment, this does not prevent them from reciting the blessing, and he could recite the shehech yanu by the kiddush, because we accept as the principal ruling like the halachic authorities who maintain that one is required to recite Shehachiyanu on both days of the holiday. Therefore, a woman who lights her candles on the second night should also recite Shehachiyanu, but again, it's best for her to do so while wearing new clothes, so when she recites that blessing, she's reciting it on that new clothes as well. Similarly, when one is blowing the shofar on the second day, because of this question of whether or not they should be reciting the Shehechianu, it is best that they wear, the person blowing the shofar should wear something new on that second day. That way, the blessing of Shehechianu can apply to that as well. But this year, we are, we're going to blow the shofar only on the second day. Then surely we recite Shehechianu because the shofar wasn't yet blown and therefore it is not an issue. My dear friends, this concludes the laws of, of Rosh Hashanah. My dear friends, have a magnificent Rosh Hashanah. Hashem should accept all of our prayers. Hashem wants our heart. Hashem wants our love and our connection. Let's do everything we can to hopefully make God king over us, this Rosh Hashanah. And in doing so, feel that closeness to Hashem. Hashem will always take care of us. But it's different when you feel that closeness with Hashem. Have a great Yantef. Shana Tova, everybody. And... A sweet, beautiful new year.